Hello, honey. Hi. Hi. How you doing uh, today? I'm doing just fine. How are you? Uh, I'm great because you're sitting really close to me. It's nice. Mm -hmm. So today we're going to talk about teens and mental health and phones and screens and social media. We're going to just dip our toes in that water. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, So this is uh, for parents and educators and soon to be parents and, um, you know, anyone that cares about young people. Yeah. Anyone that cares and Mm -hmm. wants to understand what's going on a little bit. Yeah. So apparently teens spend, you know, seven hours and 22 minutes a day on, on average, on average, on on screens, screens. which is nuts. I know. Let's just start there. Like what? I know it's, it's like a third of the day. And then you spend it's a crazy. third sleeping and then the other third is like eating and school. I don't, I don't even know. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, whether, whether that's an actual statistic or not, right. um, you know, I, I think it's high. And then if you look around just at your own experience, you probably see young people just looking down at their phones a lot, mm-hmm. even when they're together. Yeah. And now a lot of public schools, um, kids are on their screens in the classroom a lot mm-hmm, also. So I'm mm-hmm. not sure if that counts classroom screen right, time. Maybe classroom screen time is a, um, I'm sure that's a part of it. I mean, that alone would be six hours. Right. Potentially. For a lot of schools. Yeah. yeah. But we know just from our anecdotal, just observation for years now that we see a lot of young people on screens instead of playing together and playing a game or looking at each other in the eye. Yeah. And, um, and just interacting. Yeah. yeah. And, and then there's, um, so let me back this up and, uh, talk about why this subject matters to Ellen and I and kind of what we've been reading and noticing. Um, Ellen, both Ellen and I have worked with teens off and on for years. Mm-hmm. We have two teenagers now. Um, we both worked in residential treatment with teens, mm-hmm. uh, many years ago and families. Mm-hmm. Um, I was a family therapist a long time ago. And anyway, the the landscape has changed a lot. Oh, yeah. Um, And and we are really into the work of Jonathan Haidt and his book, The Anxious Generation. He also wrote The Coddling of the American Mind. And we follow Peter Gray on Substack, who's another um, public figure who's writing about this from a different angle. Well, he's writing about... He's writing about schools. About s- schools and how the education system is, is failing it's, children. It's kind of part of the problem. And part of the problem, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and then we, we talk to our friends and we talk to each other a lot about this. And we talk to our kids and, about it. And families and <clears throat> yeah. couples that we're, we work with. And, yeah. yeah. And so we just I just want to invite you to, as you come into the conversation, like, look at your own experience first. Um, if you're a parent of tweens and teens and younger kids have you noticed and do you ever fight about screen use mm-hmm. or screen time or can you set the screen down or hey it's time to come to dinner or no more screen time or you're like fighting about power struggles is there power struggles about screens in your home yeah if you have kids or um, even with your partner yeah you <laughs> notice that your partner you have a hard time getting their attention because they're often looking at their phone uh, or you're, they're multitasking on their phone while you talk. Right. Or on their laptop or whatever yeah. they're using. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, do you notice this at work? Do you see people uh, scrolling a lot? Do you scroll a lot? Um, when you're at the airport or taking public transit, do you notice that most people are not talking to each other? They're looking down. Yeah. And maybe it used to be a at newspaper a or yeah. something. But now it's like screens. Which, which have no end, right? A newspaper has like a finite amount of words, right. a book, finite amount of words, <clears throat> and a screen, there's like no end to what you could read. It's indefinite, right? It's really it, different. It's just endless. Um, do you also have a hard time with your own boundaries around the screen? Do you keep it at, next to you at night? Are you reading, scrolling in bed? Is it hard to stop? Is your partner scrolling in bed? Like these are all like the screens have just come into our lives in a really huge way. And we think, uh, they're impacting our relationships. Yeah. Significantly. Yes. That's kind of the punchline here. (laughs) So we just want to talk about that and talk about what we're doing as parents. Um, and also what we're recommending with our couples or clients. Mm -hmm. Um, and just how we can get back to connection. 
Yeah. And um, making sure we have enough of that, uh, you know, before we're prioritizing screen time over that. Yeah, totally. Mm-hmm. So um, maybe it would be helpful if I just summarize. Yeah, keep we, going. we can summarize Jonathan Haidt's yeah, yeah, go book. For it. Um, so we both read The Anxious Generation. Uh, I highly recommend it. It's kind of a popular book right now. And basically his premise is that kids are um, getting uh, less. Par- parents are basically underprotecting kids online and overprotecting kids offline. Mm-hmm. That's kind of the premise of the book. And then he drills down, of course, into lots of different things. Mm-hmm. And so to unpack that a little bit, mm-hmm. overprotecting. And, and, the, and the mental health of kids <laughs> being sort of at the center of that conversation, I yeah. think. Yeah, that kids aren't doing well. Yeah. From yeah. 2010 onward, which is around when social media became really popular and smartphones and the iPhone and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, 2010 to 2012, you know. Uh, Jonathan has seen dramatic increases in mental health problems for teens. And, and I think most people, Peter Gray included, also notice the same trend. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of research and data that, that, says, that they're looking at. Yeah, to, that, that says yeah. between 2010 and 12, like, all of a sudden, the, the rates for teen mental health challenges like depression, anxiety, and suicide go up. Yes. And it's different from boys and girls. Uh, it actually is more significant for girls over mm-hmm. the years. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, hey, what's going on? And his theory is it's um, screens and phones and social media. Yeah. Peter Gray's theory would say, hey, it's actually schools. Schools are failing kids. And then the pandemic made it worse. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. In any way, we want to focus on the screen conversation because we no- that's what we notice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think schools largely are failing kids for sure. Like I have my own opinions there. Like, you know, the school system needs to be updated. Definitely. It, you know, kids sitting in desks all day for six hours is probably not great. No. Um, <laughs> for mental health. So I, I think that's sure that's a, probably a factor. Mm-hmm. But I, I think we're more like, wow, it's just painful to to hear about and to see and witness so many young people from age one and two up. Um being handed screens and the training that that does Mm -hmm. um, and in the training away from social engagement and social interaction. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think what Peter Gray brings up as, as a problem, you know, the education system being really inadequate for what children developing children, you know, as whole human beings need. I think that's quite valid as well. Yeah. And I'm also looking at like screens, are in schools and outside of schools. They're at home. They're in bedrooms. Like they're part of family life now. So I, I guess we're looking at the screen piece as a, you know, as as a significant factor, not just happening in schools, but also outside of schools. Well, so it's just more kind of invasive in all those areas. And so, you know, um, we. I think I read something recently that that handing kids a screen to help them regulate basically to help them calm like i'd say to calm down regulation is more than just calming down but Mm -hmm. to keep kids quiet or to or to interrupt a tantrum you know the parents are going to screens or to keep them occupied like well i can take a shower and i know that you know my Mm three-year-old will be sitting there when i get out like i get that um i get why people like having that as a way to occupy them in a safe Mm-hmm. and kind of very mesmerizing way. And there's a huge downside to that, which is uh, from a very young age, children, children's nervous system regulation is being built through a screen interaction, which is incredibly different than how we evolved, which is to be regulated through human interaction. Mm -hmm. And so I think for us with our kids, like before all this research was out, before people had phones in their, you know, smartphones in their pockets. Our kids were born 2009 and 2010. We just knew that we're like, oh, we don't, we want our kids' nervous systems built on, you know, nature and attachment and human interaction. And like, that just made sense to us. It wasn't some big statement. It was just like, oh, that's what we want for them. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, and now here we are 15 years later and, 
and the world is really different and you know very small children are and families at airports like we just were traveling for two weeks so we just saw this like everyone's on their own screen there's no interaction there's no play you're waiting for a flight for an hour and everybody's just zoned into what's happening on their screen i think that is a massive change in culture that happened really really fast and from what we know about nervous systems and development it's far from optimal to yeah. for kids to spend we don't know how much time is is really the magic number there but we know that there's sp- if you're spending a, you know however much time you're spending on interacting with a screen you're that's time you're not spending interacting with other human beings face to face eye to eye who where can where emotion regulation and playfulness and all these different body experiences can be happening and be felt and be worked with yeah yeah, and, and I think it's important that we talk about the difference between privileged and underprivileged parents just for a second. Sure. That the single mother in the city who has three jobs, mm-hmm. you know, it's understandable why that person might choose to hand their kid an iPad for hours yeah. as free childcare. That makes sense to me. I, mm-hmm. I would probably do the same exact thing if I was in her shoes. Um, and privileged parents, it's a whole different conversation, in my opinion. Like, you don't need to have your screen be the child care. Um, and I just see a lot of lazy parenting uh, out there, especially in privileged parents, where you don't know how to regulate your kid, so you're just handing them your phone or an iPad, and and it's easy. I get it. It's like it's they like just immediately calm down, <laughs> and they immediately have their cartoon or their game or whatever it is so that you can have an adult conversation, so you're not that parent on the plane whose kid is freaking out and tantruming. Um, I know those were really uncomfortable moments for me when our kids would cry and scream on the plane. Mm-hmm. But we, I'd walk down the aisle. I'd hold my kid. I would like look at them. I'd communicate with them. And they'd communicate back. And we, we had a way to deal with the tantrum. Um, now it's like planes are quiet. I, I mean, you hear a crying baby because it's a baby, like a three-month-old or yeah. six-month-old. But you don't hear a lot of tantrums anymore on, on airplanes <laughs> no most and people are probably like that's great happy with that <laughs> that is fucking awesome <laughs> but we're saying yes and uh there's a there's a price being paid there's a pri- we, we have to acknowledge cost. that there's yeah. a price being paid yeah and let's just let's just take out depression yeah. anxiety and adolescence for a minute and mm-hmm. just think about your adult that child okay who's constantly getting a screen to, to regulate or to calm mm-hmm. down turning into an adult they're an adult partnership now in their 20s and 30s and they get triggered and activated by their partner what do they do do they They, know how to work with their feelings they know how to communicate well listen uh wait their turn um talk about how they feel yeah or or do they just get so triggered and uncomfortable they leave the room and just go stare at their phone and scroll because it's like that's instant relief because that's what they've always done Right. And, and it's it's sort of um, really disabling to mm-hmm. adults. Eventually, the child turns into mm-hmm. an adult who can't self-regulate, who has no idea how to communicate through a painful experience and doesn't know how to receive help. Mm-hmm. Um, doesn't know how to utilize other people to resolve and work with stress because of, any, of, they, yeah. or, you know, of any kind, really. Yeah, because they haven't got the training, the relational mm-hmm. training that a home with very little screen time gives you. Mm-hmm. And, uh, gosh, I just was thinking of something. So if you have, well, go ahead, go ahead. No, you go. Well, I can't think of it. Okay. <laughs> so so I would say just back to our house for a minute. Um, and, and we'll give oh, you some I remembered. tips. I remember. Okay. I, I want to come back to it. We'll just give, give you some tips on what we've done at our house that we think <laughs> yeah. has totally worked. Yeah. But yeah. Okay. Uh, I remembered. Sorry. So brain, I want to take us to the end. Yeah. Brain problems. I, uh, I just want us also to think about like how childhood is really long. Like human, the human mm-hmm. childhood is the longest childhood of, of any species on the planet. It is like where our brains are not fully developed until we're 26 years old. Okay. It's, we have yeah. a long period of time, a quarter of our life, if we're lucky, where our brains and bodies and nervous systems and all of it working together well are in development, in process, yeah. under construction. And that just, for me, because I've because tr- that's just the world I, I'm in, I study that stuff, I always 
saw the value of, wow, they need a lot of human interaction. And I think we've seen over the years, like how much practice, how much practice over and over and over our kids need and have needed in order to become more capable, mm -hmm. um, more emotionally intelligent, more socially adept people. It's really, so many reps. it's difficult work. Humans are really hard and human interaction is hard and it takes a, all of our resources to do it. And, yeah. and so there's a way that like a screen, screen time is really a break from that challenge. Uh, but you know, we, we, we actually, actually really need that challenge to grow. It's sort of like, learning to walk and run and climb trees, like that's all challenging, but not doing it means you'll never learn how and you'll never have the capacity. And so that's something that I just wonder about, like what's gonna happen when we have all these people coming into adulthood that didn't get the reps, that didn't get that, the the years and the thousands of interactions that it really mm -hmm. takes with with parents with teachers with Each kids other. with difficult mm -hmm. kids with good friends developing closeness like really not and not constantly interrupting that with with screen attention i i just feel like i mean i don't know how we could fully develop without it's yeah. like without having nutritious food it's just like it's just not I don't know how, yeah. how that will work. Totally. So there, there's just like the screen time that Ellen's talking about alone. And then there's the content on the screen. Right. That's another which, layer, which is like a, we'll call it social media, porn, et cetera, video games, um, just violent news, you know, fearful news, et cetera. Just the impact that has on us. Um, I, I just think can't be understated here. And with teen girls, apparently, um, it's more intense because of the relational comparison and body image and who's left in the group, who's left out of the group, who gets invited, who doesn't. Girl, girls are more sensitive to, 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 to the relational dynamics. To the social and relational dynamics, according to the research. Yeah. And whereas boys are like, uh, you know, getting more and more trained because the algorithm shows them what they see. So if I'm looking at, uh, women's bodies, for example, or teen girls or whatever, the algorithm on TikTok and Instagram are going to show me more of that. Mm -hmm. Or so, violence. Or, or violence. And so what most yeah. teen boys are looking at are girls, women, um, in scantily clad or maybe naked, and violence, you know, violent videos, um, video game stuff, uh, et cetera. And it's just, it's just like, okay, so that's where our kids are getting the bulk of their training socially and relationally is through a screen instead of out on the playground or at the mall when there's no phones present and they're just interacting and mm -hmm. trying to figure out a game and they've got to make up the rules. Um, mm -hmm. I'm thinking of like grade school or kids and the fun chat and the challenge that come with mm -hmm. social interaction offline. And this right. is one of Jonathan's arguments is that parents are, over protecting kids because of stranger danger and all the things offline, like out in the world, quote, real world. And they're under protecting them online because it is interesting to me. And I, I totally agree with that. I just see that over and over where um, there's a lot of helicopter kind of safetyism parenting going on. Um, well, my kid's kind of sensitive. And I can't like let him do the X, Y, and Z. But then I'll hand him my phone or I'll give him a phone at age 11 or 12 and they can do whatever they want. And just so I get a break, like that's, yeah, you know, that's just mind boggling to me. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. So yeah, there's all the content that, yeah. that's happening on the phone that, uh, and then as Ellen was pointing out, the, um, every day that goes by is a day missed of relational training mm -hmm. and social training. So if I, if I look around at boys, I'm like, how, how many of these boys are going to actually be able to go on a date <laughs> and ask a girl out and communicate right. and look in her eyes and actually share how he feels, care for her, or interest in her, or attracted to her. Or, hey, will you go on, you know, to the prom with me or whatever? I see a lot of incompetent boys who not only are dismissive toward girls, but don't know how to talk to girls mm -hmm. uh, because they're just on their phone all the time. Yeah, they're not getting. And then there's practice. Yeah, and then there's of course layers of misogyny and all the things about how mm -hmm. boys talk about girls, which is still very you know, active, <laughs> very alive and well. Sadly. Yeah, sadly. Yeah. Yeah. So I just, I, I get, I start to really think about this and I get overwhelmed mm -hmm. and I just I'm like, mm -hmm. holy mm -hmm. shit, this is, this is a lot. Yeah. And this I, and I, I just think us, particularly parents and, um, 
can do something about it. Yeah. Teachers, I think their hands are tied a little more. Oh yeah. But they have sure have an uphill battle with kids in a big classroom of 30 kids. Like when you're, when they say, Hey, put your phones away. Like parents, teachers become cops, policing phone use and kids are over there like holding up their book and like on their laptops playing Minecraft. I actually saw this touring one of the kid with the high schools for my kid. You know, it's just like, wow. Yeah. The teachers are up against. Yeah. And I, and I don't know if parents understand how much their kids are actually on their phones while in class yeah and or during lunch when they're supposed to be <laughs> hanging out with each other or playing frisbee or whatever yeah um I'm, I'm just also thinking about my mind's going back to when texting first started mm -hmm. and how i started having clients come in showing me their text threads and their dialogues you know like this guy broke up with me or this friend like betrayals and mm -hmm. just terrible terrible experiences or arguments all all over text and i just remember being like oh this is so bad like we you know my 18 year old client or 17 year old client like needs to be doing all this in person like this is not supposed to be happening at a distance where you yeah. can't read someone's face where you don't see the impact of what you're saying and and just really trying to even teach my younger clients back then like how to like, look, this is not a sufficient way to do yeah. really much more than logistics, you know, over text. And so, and now obviously that has just gotten so, so much mm -hmm. more intense because now there's social media and we all know like just how vicious social media can be. And, you know, no one's seeing the impact of their words. No one yeah. is having to really yeah. be responsible for what they <clears throat> say or how they, how they say things. And we're just... Yeah, like our etiquette and our way of treating each other, I think has has gotten obviously really poor online. I I imagine most people see that, and then I, I think that's trickling out into the world. Just how how we treat each other, how we disregard each other, how we're dismissive. I I just see much less, much more hiding behind, especially among young people, hiding behind screens, and not being attentive really to the world around them or people around mm -hmm. them. Like if you know, if I think about myself during adolescence and like how uncomfortable it was to be alone somewhere or like walking by myself through school sometimes, yeah. like at 14, 15, like I would have totally grabbed my phone and just like been like, I'm just going to look like I'm doing something. Yeah. And, and so it's just, I think we just need to appreciate the, that yes, young children being put on screens has, has real drawbacks. And, and then also older kids too, because there's so much, social development that's happening through adolescence and it's a really it's a very sensitive period jonathan Haidt talks about mm -hmm. that too and it's really a time when they need to be in their bodies and in their world and figure out who they are and not watching who everyone else claims to be on the screen yeah you know if you're in pain relationally and you need immediate support uh our coaches can help you I've trained uh, almost 100 coaches at this point, relationship coaches that are amazing humans, and they have the chops to help you uh, get through this hard time, this hard moment you're going through. Uh, or if you want to actually hire a coach and have someone in your corner to continue to um, up-level your communication skills, your listening skills, your conflict skills, these folks are incredible, okay? So go. all you need to do is go to relationshipschool.com forward slash MRC. That stands for My Relationship Coach. So relationshipschool.com forward slash MRC, right? If you want immediate, direct, effective help, check them out. Hey, y'all. I hope you have ordered my new book by now, Getting to Zero, How to Work Through Conflict in Your High Stakes Relationships. It's already getting dozens of five-star reviews on Amazon. I've heard from a lot of you. Thank you for buying the book, buying it on Audible, buying it on Kindle. Uh, I really appreciate it. Really appreciate the support. I think this book is going to help a lot of people. It's all about how do we get back to a good place after some kind of disconnection or rupture or conflict. That's what the entire book is at, about. And if you want a roadmap on how to get back to a good place, what I call zero, um, please order my book. Getting to zero book.com get you some extra goodies, a conflict quiz, some additional PDFs, etc. And uh, you can order it in all the places and support your local bookstores. It's yeah. it's so um, sad, really. Yeah. Um, and and parents struggle with this. Parents struggle I mean, with this again. Every every 
couple I have that has kids has talked about the challenge with screens at home, like every yeah. single one. Yeah. And they don't. And most of them will say, we don't. I'm like, okay, so what are your boundaries? And they're like, well, we don't really have any. We just kind of reach a threshold every day and start being like, you know, you, you got to put the screens away or you got to stop or like, it's very, mm -hmm. well, everything just shuts down at 10 o'clock, but my kids have figured out how to override that system now. And you know, that's, yeah. it's like, even right. the adults don't know how to manage that. It's hard for us to manage ourselves around it. I will acknowledge that yeah. I have to like be very attentive there. And then of course our kids can't manage it. And then we're trying to figure out how to manage it all for them. And then they're resisting that. And then we don't want to fight them. Like it's, it's a huge it's family huge. issue and you know i i think for most families at this point if you aren't very very clear about how you want to do this and then and then really being consistent about it yeah again we'll share our plan here in a minute i mean just think about your childhood okay i know most of the people listening to this are probably over the age of 30. um you know if you're a gen xer for example uh like ellen and i you grew up with tv and in my house, the TV was on a lot and I would come home from school and immediately at three o'clock I'd watch cartoons for like an hour and then, you know, um, maybe do some homework, maybe play a sport or whatever. And then I was on the TV again after dinner Our the TV would always come on after dinner. It would be on before dinner. We'd eat dinner with the TV off and then the TV was on again. Um, till 10 o'clock at night or 10 30 the evening news was over and i think about how much screen time i had then as with a tv and how compromised my parents were relationally to like deal with my, me and my feelings and my siblings and i and our feelings just think about like your childhood okay that like that that probably had its own challenges with tv um, and whatever the, the parenting was, whatever relational misattunements you got and whatever kind of shaming, non-validating environments you grew up in, now add in a phone. Where I, everyone I just, has their own device. Own device all the time. With access to everything all the yeah, time. I just I think mean, it's gotten steeper now. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. And so if you already are relationally compromised and the phones come in, you're, you're adding even more challenge to get the kind of relationship you want and the kind of intimate partnership you want and create the family you want. So I just think it's steep. Um, obviously I want to, Ellen and I are doing something about that. We're trying to help people learn connection, attunement, presence, empathy, mm -hmm. you know, listening and all the conflict resolution, all the things. Um, but we're, we're up, we're up against um, yeah. this little uh, amazingly yeah. compelling gadget in our hands. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. that we have access to the internet 24-7 and the, the, AI. It's like the, fascinating. That's built to keep us on it as much as possible. Yeah. They know what they're doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I feel, I feel, I, I get angry when I think about the social media platforms that I use uh, for my business um, and sharing with family, photos, et cetera, and what they're doing with teens. I just, I just don't think, it's very upsetting to me mm -hmm. in terms of the algorithm and that I, I just wish there were settings in Instagram yeah. and on TikTok that, you know, parental controls basically that said, yep, nope, my kid can't do, there's no explore page. There's no, um, we're not going to send them more violent videos and more porn. If they look at it once, we're not going to do that. Um, yeah. if you click this setting, seems easy to me. Yeah. But seems like a, we could have I'm more an app developer. Yeah. It seems like we could and should have more uh, choice there, but we don't at yeah. this point. Yeah. So we can write our congressmen and women, uh, of course we can take mm -hmm. actions like that. Yeah. And there's things like the surgeon general is now, you know, considering making a surgeon general's warning about, I think social media. Yeah. Uh, there's, I think the LA, I just heard that, uh, the Los Angeles school district just banned phones from their public schools. Wow. And they want the whole state to do that. And there's, there's, I think, a couple other states or districts that have done that in the country. And I mean, my guess is that's kind of where this is going because kids aren't focused in class. There's already enough challenges when it comes to learning for kids in the yeah. education, the way the education environment is set up. Now we have phones in the way. I just, I cannot imagine how anyone is <laughs> wanting to work in that system, honestly, because it's so... yeah set up to not not be successful for teachers or kids 
in so many ways. I, I know that there's amazing people in there trying to do good work. There are in our kids' schools. And uh, there's some steep challenges for sure. Yeah. I mean, how does a teacher compete with TikTok? Right. It's not even possible. Right. <laughs> um, so let's get into Jonathan Haidt's four recommendations that he has in the book. Okay. Uh, Ellen was just talking about one of them, which is phone-free schools. Another one was um, wait to give your kid a smartphone, period, until age 13. Um, he's now saying 14. He was saying 13. Now I think he's saying 14. High school, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, you can give him a flip phone before that for like, you know, um, after school activities. Hey, pick me up, drop offs, the, the basic text. Yeah, texting and calling. Texting slower. So it's like there's not a lot can be done on a flip phone or a yeah. super basic phone. And they actually are making more of those kind of phones now. Um, and then another one is delay social media until age 16 uh, for teenagers, which I think is amazing. And it's going to be hard. Um, we're planning on that. Uh, oh yeah. And we didn't give our kids phones until, uh, our daughter got one a little early, barely before 13 mm-hmm. and our son got him at 13. Mm-hmm. Um, and he got a basic flip phone. It was called a pinwheel phone and it had no access to the internet. It was a super limited text and call only phone, which was a great he could take pictures starter too. phone. Yeah. yeah. It had a camera on a it. Camera. Anyway, um, And we're, you know, I'm a no to social media. Yeah, our kids don't have social media. It's just like, no way. Or games. Down that road. (laughs) Or games. So that's one of them. That's us. And that's how we're doing that. The final fourth one, the fourth recommendation that Height says, I think, is, if I remember right, is um, get your kids outside doing free play more that's unsupervised. So parents aren't like, Watching your kids, well, or something like well, that. Well, so it so isn't fourth, all. I, I, is that the fourth one. I think so. I think the the unsupervised play, like free play, like um, yeah, not not adult led play, because because a, a lot of us have our kids in sports, and these are sort of adult led kind of. I think he thinks you know they're they're controlled environments. It's not giving kids enough practice sorting th- sorting out and figuring out their own rules, their own yeah. ways of dealing with conflict and all of that. And that he, him and Peter Gray agrees with that too. Like kids need a lot more unstructured free time, you know, where they yeah. get to just create, be, not be so structured because that's, that's impacting kids in terms of their mental health too. Yeah. So we need to let kids be kids playing yeah. outside more. And sadly, so many kids don't want to play outside. They want to stay inside on their phones. Um, in fact, my niece is, this is just a few years ago. My brother was talking about how um, his daughter didn't care to go get her driver's license because she didn't need to, she wasn't motivated to go see her friends because she could see her friends all the time online at home. That was, that's interesting, right? I think a lot more and more kids are not seeking the freedom that we wanted oh, yeah. because they have freedom in their hand. Yeah. Or perceived freedom. Perceived anyway. freedom, yes, I would say. Okay, now let's just mention maybe what we've done. What yeah. Else, what else we've done in our home. Right. Um, we, we made a choice early on about planes and airports and things like that, that our kids, we road would just trips. bring road trips. We just bring coloring books, books, knitting, um, games. That was it. There was no like iPads, no movie watching. Our, our son, I don't even think, watched a movie until he was 10 or 11, mm-hmm. his first movie. And that felt really right for our family because we just knew you open that door, the earlier you open the door, the more that door, they want the, what's in the door. Um, and that's understandable. You can't like blame a child for wanting the screen uh, mm-hmm. because it's very compelling and the animation is so crazy now and there's, yeah. there's something for every age. Yeah, and you and I aren't really tv watchers or even really movie watchers like we're not yeah. great at so for us with little kids it was not hard to be like we're not we're not doing movies and shows because we don't even really do that we didn't even have a tv in our house till what, till two years about ago. two years ago so we just it's not really important to jason and yeah. i and therefore we're out of the loop on like some of the cool shows people are watching that's true like yeah. we're we're you know you're you, we you watch more of that now yeah I, I, i'll I get still, on netflix and watch a show yeah and there i get into a series I'm, once in a I'm while i'm still totally out of the loop mostly but you know, for us and who we are, that was really easy to do. I know that's not everyone, but it just, it was just part of, Yeah, it was, and then, yeah, so we'd take road trips, long road trips and yeah, traveling or um, meals out, like never brought screens. Yeah. We did them, you know, like 80s style, 
Like just right. you're looking out the window while you're driving, you're yeah, singing you're, you're songs, out, like whatever, <laughs> lots of snacks. So that was, that was great. That was great for them. Yeah. And, and we would, we're, we're a relationally driven culture in our family. So instead of handing the kid the screen, like on a road trip to like a six hour road trip, Ellen, usually sometimes mm-hmm. me would get in the back seat with our, you know, three and six year old, three and five year old or you know, six and eight year old and interact with them Yeah, and, you know, help them with their snacks and play a game with them and point out the window and stuff. Or we did do one thing, which was audio books. Yeah. We slowly introduced audio books. So we did bring, what was that? An iPad at first? No, I think we had, uh, how did we listen to it? I want to say we did it somehow like Bluetooth, like on our, like podcasts. There's like, there's amazing children's stories there's like podcasts that just do children's stories yeah um, like um uh little stories for tiny people yeah one of yeah it was one we listened uh, to a bunch i can't remember them circle all now round circle round has stories so uh we would do that a lot and just put that on and we'd all be listening or <laughs> um yeah sometimes they had headphones for that we also had um yep yeah, we also had the resources as to, they got older they could listen to their own stories because they started yeah not liking the same stories or, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And we had the privilege of, uh, being able to afford a Waldorf school. So our kids right. went to a Waldorf school, which is very delayed on certain things like screen. There's not like kids aren't on computers in Waldorf schools till high school. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that was a really good fit for us. Mm-hmm. And we wanted to preserve our kids' imagination and their ability to like learn, uh, anything, basically be outside a lot. So that was also part of the motivation for us around, we didn't want Disney movies all the time in their face and Disney products uh, because we wanted them to imagine a story. Mm -hmm. And in Waldorf, the teachers are really good storytellers. And so the kids are like, yeah, they're like, (laughs) if you ever watch a room full of Waldorf kids and a teacher, the kids are just enthralled when the teacher is telling a story because their, their imaginations are all so bright and they're right there in inside the story. (laughs) It's really beautiful. It's so cool. So we also had the support of community where our kids weren't, they weren't, it's not like they were in a traditional setting where all their other eight, nine year olds had phones or were watching tons of movies. And that's what everyone was talking about. Like that just wasn't, that wasn't the culture we were in. And so, um, that was really supportive to how we were doing things. Yeah. Cause our kids never felt like they were missing out. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that, that's obviously a big one with social media. That'll be a challenge for us probably with our daughter. Um, if she wants to get on social media someday, and we're shutting her down and all her friends are on it because we can't do anything about the other parents, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and, and so far, our 15-year-old hasn't really, a- he hasn't asked to be on social media. He yeah. doesn't doesn't want it. So delaying it for us hasn't promoted like more desire or something. It hasn't made it more attractive. Yeah. No, and I think, why do you think that is? Like, what, what do you think is happening there? I, I don't know. I think, I mean, I think that it, it really helped that we were in a community and in a, a social environment where screens were just like not at the center yeah. and, and, and movies or shows or whatever videos just weren't what kids were talking about. And so, I mean, I think if I could speak for Lucian, he might, he might say, yeah, I'm, I'm like, there's a lot I don't know about pop culture. And that's sometimes he feels like in the dark and doesn't love that. But I think he, he also doesn't crave more of that. That's like, it's just not where he wants to hang out. He wants to, he wants to keep finding kids he can connect with. And yeah, I don't know. They're just, it's just has not been something they've pushed for. Yeah. And, and he, he finds the kids who want to connect. Um, yeah, there, there are kids, obviously we're not pathologizing all teenagers. Of course. Yeah. There's kids that, that do prefer, like, like Jonathan Haidt talks about this, that a lot of, a lot of young people are actually annoyed at how much they're on their phones. Yes. They're, they don't like it. It's yeah. not something like, oh, this I feel so good when I'm on my phone all day. No, it's like I feel worse and worse the longer I stay off it, but I kind of can't get off it because that's where everything's happening. Mm-hmm. And so it's this catch-22 and this like bind that kids find themselves in because um, to be off of it is to be left out potentially. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, yeah, more nature time, less phone time leads to more connection. And I, I just think kids are going to grow up. If you can do your best to Minimize. Aspire, aspire to a relational culture, mm. it's sort of the tone of a relational culture in your home 
means that you value relationships over phones. And so at the dinner table, there's no phones present. Uh, in the evening after a certain hour, eight o'clock, our phones are like on the phone counter plugged in, which is not even on the same level as our bedrooms. You know, like you just want to like creating a relational culture is we, we put the phone somewhere and we're, you know, or the screen somewhere after yeah. a certain time, you know, you have boundaries, right? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Boundaries yeah. and prioritizing each other versus what's happening in our, in the phone, in our hand or on the screen. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and obviously this can be, uh, I, you often hear me say, listeners might often hear me say people set their lives up with how much intimacy they can tolerate. Mm -hmm. And so some of us grew up in relationally deficit void cultures or, or traumatic, hurtful cultures. And so to be in contact with another person a lot is like confronting and it's an energy and, and an energy intensive. It's it really is intensive. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a lot to, to stay in connection. Um, mm -hmm. and it ultimately I think is very resourcing, but if you grew up where that was not the case, it can feel kind of overwhelming. So people go to their phones or they sit by side by side and watch Netflix every night because that's the way they connect. Um, which is, you know, it's one way to do a partnership. But. Yeah. But, but I would also say that everyone who comes in for therapy and coaching, they'll, they'll kind of out themselves at some point that they're like, look, our evenings where we're just watching something together or you're on your phone and I'm on my phone, like that isn't working for us. Like, yeah. like people, especially of our generation, we, we've seen the, the change and, uh, people will call themselves out as like, look, this is, we're doing like what's low hanging fruit. We're tired. It's the end of the day. We're sort of done. Yeah. But like, how are we going to work with that so that our relationship doesn't suffer or the time we have to connect isn't whittled away like that? Uh, but younger people who grew up on this stuff and grew up watching their parents um, be very distracted by their phones and what's happening on the phone, like that's, we don't really know where that's going. Mm -hmm. um, we already have enough adults in our practices struggling with someone being um, you know, who withdraws a lot or doesn't communicate well or doesn't have, um, you know, isn't good at knowing what they feel and how to talk about it. And, and those are people that did not grow up being regulated by a screen. They did have people around. They didn't clearly have enough of it, probably. But right. um, I, I just think this is only going to become more of an issue because more and more people now are just not getting enough interactive regulation to to really develop all these again this long childhood to develop these very intricate complex capacities mm -hmm. for for real you know interacting with and um doing all the things we need to do together as humans so yeah, yeah. so um you know take a stand perhaps if this is you if this resonates for a more relational culture Consider Jonathan Heights sort of four tips. Um, consider what we do in our home that's really working for us. It's working mm -hmm. really well for us. Um, yeah, and learn the skills required to you know collaborate and communicate well, so that you can face these challenges as a family, as partners, as individuals. Yeah. And it's it's not too late to create you know new boundaries mm -hmm. around screen time in your home uh, between the adults in the home or for the kids in the home, like you can always, can always change things just because things are set up the way they are right now. doesn't mean you right. can't say, you know, we're going to try something different. I don't think this is working great for us. We want to have, you know, three nights a week that are phone free or we want, you know, like you can do anything here. Like mm -hmm. you could do anything to move the needle towards, you know, a little more time outside, a little more time interacting a little more time just being you know reading or painting or <laughs> thinking or yeah. writing i mean there's so many other things to do um that aren't happening because the screens are so compelling and they're such an easy source of input and r really any any direction or any modeling like our kids need to learn how they're gonna navigate phones and technology and have boundaries around it for themselves like just i just want to give parents lots of permission to mm -hmm. to try things say we're gonna try this for a month and then we'll weigh in and see how everyone's doing with it or you know i think parents get scared of setting boundaries and then there being more power struggles or the kids being upset and and really like you can change this anytime if you think this is what's best for your kids try it 
like the way you think brushing their teeth every night yeah. is good for them or wearing a seatbelt or <laughs> a helmet or whatever you think, you know, there are things we enforce as parents because we know or have a really good sense that this is going to be good for them. And it's the same is true with technology. Yeah. Really well said. Thank you. And yeah, when you don't remember, when you don't drive this and choose and choose how you're going to drive this, it's going to drive you. Totally. Hey, thanks, honey. Okay. That was probably plenty. Yeah. But feel free to leave comments or more questions. Uh, maybe we could do another podcast episode on just questions people have around this or concerns or yeah, anything. Yeah. yeah. And all the resources we mentioned will be in the show notes. So check them out. Okay. okay. Peace.